Hello, class. Professor Mandeville back. This is lecture number four for History 101, Summer 2020. And today I want to wrap up chapter one, which your, uh, what uh, Foner covers at the very end, which is a very brief look at French colonization, which we'll be talking about in much more detail later with the relationship with the British, and Dutch colonization. So we're going to touch on the early parts of both of those today, and we'll be getting back to uh, what ultimately happens to the Dutch in 1660, and then the struggle between the French and the British, which ends up in uh, on and off wars in North America for over a 100-year period. So, to the French, first of all. The first French explorer to come to North America and explore around the uh, mouth of the St. Lawrence and up the St. Lawrence a little bit was all the way back in 1535, and that was Jacques Cartier. He will explore, but it'll be quite some time uh, before <clears throat> the uh, French once again decide that it's time to colonize North America. And what's really going to spur on the French and the British to colonize here in North America is Spain. Now, remember, we've talked about Spain. They arrived here in 1492, and by the time 1600 rolls around, they are firmly established in North, South America, and the Caribbean, which will spur along their rivals, the French and the British, to enter the colonial empire game in the Western Hemisphere. So, with the French, the real hero of French colonization and establishing permanent settlements here in North America is Samuel D. Champlain. Champlain will make his first voyage uh, to uh, North America in 1600, and he'll start exploring along the northern coast of present-day United States, along the coast of Maine. If you've ever been to uh, uh, Arcadia National Park in Maine, uh, Mount Desert Island was first, the first European to step foot on Mount Desert Island, which is Acadia National Park was Samuel D. Champlain, uh, but he'll end up exploring well up the St. Lawrence River, and he'll ultimately, uh, through many voyages and a lot of trials and tribulations, establish uh, <clears throat> the French settlement at Quebec in 1608. Later on, he'll help establish uh, a fur trading outpost, which he had explored earlier at present-day Montreal. And this is going to be, from 1600 to 1609, a time of real strife for Champlain and the early settlers. And the problem is, it's very difficult for him and the French to survive the very harsh winters on the St. Lawrence River. Ultimately, they'll figure out the best way to survive is to emulate the Native Americans who live up and down the St. Lawrence River. Because as they observe them, they realize these people have no problem surviving the winter. They know what they're doing. They build very secure homes. We talked about tribes of the Northeast. They live in their own version of longhouses. <clears throat> the tribes on the St. Lawrence River are a different grouping of tribes, and they are traditionally rivals and sometimes enemies of the Iroquois that we focused on, and these are Algonquian-speaking people. Now, one thing that I'll establish real fast here, uh, the Iroquois Confederation is a league of five, then six nations, but part of the reason why it's called Iroquois, besides it being misnamed by French Jesuits, it's a language group. The Mohawk and all the other Iroquoian uh, 
groups in the Confederation speak a related language. They have their own specific, like Mohawk and Seneca and so forth, but they're all part of a major group called Iroquoian. The Algonquian language is very, very different, even though they're so close to the Iroquois. The Abenaki or Abenaki, who live in Vermont and into New Hampshire and all the way into Maine at one point, are Algonquian speakers. So are the Cree, so are the Montagnan, so are the Hurons. And these are the Indians, especially the Montagnan and Hurons and others, who will become the allies of France, thanks to Samuel D. Champlain. Champlain knows he needs to emulate these people and become friends with them if the French have any chance of establishing what they're going to call New France, which originally is up and down the St. Lawrence River. So he becomes very friendly with them. And in fact, at one point, he takes two Native American chiefs back to France with him on one of his voyages to meet the King of France to firm up this relationship. This is also how the French will become uh, very accomplished fur traders because the French quickly discover, unlike what Spain's finding, there's no gold to be found in the St. Lawrence River Valley. But there's another form of gold, furs, and specifically beaver pelts are very highly prized in all of Europe at this point in history. <clears throat> so, one of the major turning points for Champlain and the French relationship with native people, especially the Algonquian speakers, comes in 1609, when Champlain accompanies a group of Algonquian warriors, Montagnan, Hurons, and others, and he goes down with them to explore, ex excuse me, explore Iroquois country, namely... Lake Champlain that bears his name today. And he will go with them, uh, Champlain and a couple of his soldiers, but it'll be a very small contingency of French. Uh, there'll be two officers in Champlain and then a whole, uh, uh, you know, canoe after canoe full of Algonquian warriors. They're enemies with the Iroquois, so they go and paddle down into the center of Iroquois in Mohawk territory at the time, Lake Champlain. They will encounter a Iroquois war party, mainly made up of Mohawk Indians, at Crown Point. Many of you might be familiar with Crown Point, New York. It's where the bridge uh, connects Crown Point, New York, to Chimney Point, Vermont, remember they had condemned the old bridge a few years back and had to build a brand new one. There's state historic sites on both sides of the bridge. There's the Crown Point State Historic Site on the New York side. There's the Chimney Point Interpretive Center on, on the uh, Vermont side. On the New York side is where uh, Champlain, his Algonquian allies landed, and then they encountered a war party of Iroquois. In this famous encounter, Champlain will fire his weapon, which he was carrying with him, a blunderbust. A blunderbust is almost like an old-time bazooka. They're these huge sort of shotgun bazooka-type weapons. He fires it at the Iroquois and... He was a pretty lucky shot, I suppose. Uh, he ended up killing with one shot two Iroquoian chiefs who were leading the charge. These Iroquois had never seen a firearm before. This stunned and amazed them, and then they were shocked to see two of their leaders dead on the ground. This will cause them to retreat, the Algonquians will see this as a big victory where they flex their new muscle with their French ally 
against their age-old enemy, the Iroquois. And this will bond the relationship in the early days between the French and their native allies on the St. Lawrence. Champlain will explore around a little bit more on Lake Champlain, write a lot about how beautiful it is in his diary, and then return back up to the St. Lawrence and continue to develop what will become known as New France on the St. Lawrence River. This will really develop into a prosperous uh, colony, mainly due to the fur trading relationship that is also then fostered by Champlain and uh, those who follow him from France. And the French will be very smart. The native people are very good at fur trapping. Why reinvent the wheel? Learn from them. In fact, the early French settlers who stayed here were commonly known in uh, French as the Courier des Bois, which means forest runner. That's because they dressed and looked like Native American people. Couldn't tell the difference between them in the forest if you came upon them until you got real close. These Courier des Bois, who were French fur traders, and trappers also married into Native American tribes. And there's a couple reasons for this. One of which, when you had uh, in many winters in the beginning, three quarters of Champlain's men starving to death, and he'd have to return back to France to gather more men to establish the colony in the early days, there were no women interested in coming to the St. Lawrence River Valley. It'd be like being sent to Siberia to somebody. So if you wanted to get married and you're starting to become a prosperous fur trapper and trader, you married a Native American woman. And remember these tribes of the Northeast. They're matriarchal societies. So when you marry a Native American woman, you automatically become a member of the tribe and a member of her mother's family. This was a real in for the Courier des Bois. Now they're part of the tribe. This makes fur trading with them much simpler. So this is part of the reason why they're so successful in the beginning and have a very good relationship with Native American people, as opposed to the Spanish and the black legend that I explained to you. Another reason why was the French priests sent here, there were Jesuit priests, very different from the Spanish padres who set up Spanish missions, which as one of my old professors like to call them, were church forts. They were like armed church fortresses. French Jesuits established missions. They had no troops attached to them. The Jesuits are a teaching order of priests from France. And they're still present in the United States today. Uh, and you may be familiar with one Jesuit college because they're still a teaching order. They're involved in higher education. And one famous Jesuit college that's not too far from here that you may know of, is Siena College, just north of Albany. The president of Siena College is a Jesuit priest. So that's what we're going to cover on France up to this point. We'll get back to them later when we get the British as part of the equation. I want to talk to you a little bit about the Dutch. Now, the Dutch are not your typical empire. They're a trading empire. They're not really interested in controlling massive amounts of land to make their empire stronger. They're interested in establishing trade relationships to make their trading empire stronger. So unlike the French, the British, and the Spanish, they're not going to come to North America to conquer and claim massive tracts of land. They just want sort of a trading beachhead in North America after they figure out the other Europeans are going there. They're there to stay. There's a lot of business opportunity. 
Now, I mentioned that Samuel D. Champlain came down and named Lake Champlain in uh, 1609. And in fact, that conflict between he, his Indian allies, and the Iroquois happened on June 28, 1609. <clears throat> 1609 is a big year in what will become New York State history. Champlain is in the north, exploring Lake Champlain, and the Dutch send an explorer to North America to claim land for them to establish their trade center. To give you an idea of how different they are, they don't really have that many experienced explorers, so they hire a Brit to do the exploring for them. He's kind of like a free agent explorer, I suppose. So was Columbus, though. Remember, he was an Italian, explored for the Spanish. And that explorer's name is Henry Hudson. Now, Henry Hudson will be hired by the Dutch to go and explore an a area of North America. He sailed to North America before. And he uh, will sail to North America in 1609, He'll sail up the Hudson River, which he names after himself, and he will establish the Dutch colony of the New Netherlands. Now, uh, Henry Hudson is in, uh, you know, the Hudson River Valley the same year in some of the same times that Samuel D. Champlain is up on Lake Champlain. Obviously, neither of them know they're there. So Henry Hudson uh, sails up, claims the Hudson River Valley all the way up to present day uh, Albany in the Schenectady area. Uh, and that creates the brand new Dutch colony of the New Netherlands. Now, uh, the Dutch will slowly but surely then start to come over and settle the area. And they will also uh, establish a fortress at both ends of their uh, colonial holdings on the Hudson River Valley. They build a northern fort up where Albany is today, and that fort is named Fort Orange. Then they'll also build a fort down at the mouth of the Hudson River, on Manhattan, uh, near where Battery Park is today. And that will ultimately evolve into the Dutch city of New Amsterdam. So New York City, before when it was under Dutch control, was known as New Amsterdam. Now, uh, in a future lecture, I'm going to tell you about how the Dutch... Uh, believed they acquired Manhattan and ended up building their uh, main enterprises there, but up and down the Hudson River Valley, because uh, the next time we talk about the Dutch, we'll talk about the British seizing the New Netherlands and New Amsterdam from the Dutch in 1660. But I'll explain to you then how the Dutch uh, believed that they bought Manhattan from the Native Americans. And as we'll find out, it was complete misunderstanding and a clash of cultures. So uh, we'll cover that in the near future. That's it for today. Now I can't uh, express enough to you guys. You need to get into the module two discussion. 24% of your grade is discussion grades. And you guys haven't done it. And it closes on Wednesday. You're going to be real disappointed when I send out great updates. And you also need to get your textbook, get that access card, and get on there and do the Chapter 1 Inquisitive. And if you haven't proposed to me a topic for your paper, that's due Wednesday also. This is all mounting up, but that module's been open since May 31st. So you guys all need to really start to get to work. This summer cl class this is faster paced and there are a lot of things that fall on you to be responsible to get done in time because once module two closes, 
It's closed. There's no going back to enter any new discussions. Due dates are due dates in my class. You know them well in advance, and I will not accept anything late, period. So, please get to work. You got till Wednesday, but don't frantically wait till Wednesday to enter that discussion because it won't count for anything. So, I'll be back next week with some more lectures on the material we're going to be covering. Uh, everyone be safe. Take care. Bye now.